I'm Andreas Heinemeyer and I'm a senior researcher or associate professor here at the Environment and Geography Department at the University of York and I have been spending the last 15 years or so working on peatlands and looking at the evidence yeah, underpinning how peatland ecosystems work in response to climate change but also management uh, especially over the last 10 years I've been looking at how heather management could be beneficial or also has certain trade-offs on ecosystem functions so I look at carbon, water, greenhouse gas emissions, ecosystem services sort of peatlands provide that's what I've been doing. Heather burning, firstly what I found out is that we know relatively little. So we call it evidence. Uh, so what has been done previously in a scientific way to assess actual impacts of heather management. And there is surprisingly little known uh, in relation to burning impacts, for example, on water quality. It's uh, very limited what has been done, but also very conflicting evidence. So some studies show it's a positive effect, some studies show it's no effect, other studies show it's a negative effect. So it's very um, unclear, actually, what the impacts are when you look at the evidence. And my own work uh, went that bit further because our DEFRA in Natural England here in, in England realised that we do not actually know for sure what the impacts are of heather management on ecosystem services of upland peatlands. So they commissioned 10 years ago a study uh, for me to look at comparing this our previously conventional burn rotation management of heather on uh, the ecosystem services of peatlands and compare it to alternative cutting, like with gigantic lawnmowers basically, the tractors going over and cutting the heather, uh, or not doing anything. Uh, so I started that 10 years ago uh, to look at that because the evidence base wasn't there. Yeah, so that DEFRA uh, funded period was only the first five years. And basically the take home message was, Oh, well, it's a system in transition uh, and we don't know. Uh, and the peer reviewers, so other scientists uh, assessing that report, which I wrote for DEFRA, they pointed out we can't actually get any take home message from it after five years. You wouldn't do that with a forest study. Uh, why should we do it with peatlands? So they recommended it needs to be ideally a 20, 25 year long study. Uh, but, oh well, notwithstanding that time limitation or after 10 years with additional funding from other funding sources we actually see that well, when you compare burning of vegetation not the peat of vegetation that is to alternative cutting that there are certain trade-offs so it's not clear-cut bad or good for either of those managements and it gets even more complicated when you look at the other alternative of not managing the vegetation at all. Uh, maybe I start with the latter one, so not managing at all, what you end up with with quite old aging heather. And like with forests, when you become very old, your respiration, your losses of carbon for maintaining yourself increase year after year because your biomass just gets bigger. But you're also getting older, you are getting less efficient, like we humans tend to, that's the same with aging vegetation. So it's less efficient at taking up carbon and that's what we measure in the field. But also what people didn't maybe quite think about is that when you have very tall heather, you have lots of leaves, you transpire, you lose lots of water. Where do you get that water from? From the peat. So old aging big heather tends to dry out the peat and that's what we find at our sites. And now that is a very big concern because locking away carbon in peatlands relies on peat being wet. Anything which dries it is bad. So drainage is one extreme, but aging heather seems to be another one. So the benefit of either management would be to reduce that water loss, keep the peat wetter. 
And I, I think uh, one aspect I actually found with other researchers across the UK is that, that one big issue is that in the evidence base assessing uh, newer burn or whatever prescribed burning you, you want to call it uh, on heather dominant peatlands is that the evidence base has been mixed up with drainage impacts which we know are detrimental to so many things about peatlands. So there is no arguing for drainage. I think everybody agrees peatlands need to be without drainage. We need to keep them wet. Uh, but it, this has been mixed up with management of heather. Uh, now, but you can do management of heather without drainage. And that is, I think, what we need to assess in the evidence base. The pieces we actually have of scientific studies, did they actually allow a separation of the impact of drainage versus impact of management of heather? And there are so many studies where we can't do that. So that is actually a big issue. And when, when we look at uh, comparing burning and cutting in our study, what we actually see is, well, take carbon for example, oh, well, it, it relies of course of biomass taking up carbon, fixing it and then letting the litter drop and form peat over time by organic matter decomposing over time or not so in peatlands because they're cold and wet. Um, but with burning we have another aspect. Uh, during combustion of course you lose a lot of carbon to the atmosphere. You see it, uh, smoke, gone up in smoke. But actually what you might overlook is that during burning, incomplete combustion, you create a form of biochar, charcoal, because it's incomplete combustion. The burning of the heather is under cold and wet conditions. It's not with good oxygen supply. So you create charcoal and quite a lot of it actually. And that is part of a peatland's long-term carbon budget. You actually find charcoal layers when you take out a peat core, and they might be thousands or hundreds of years old, but that stuff doesn't tend to decompose. So it's locked away carbon, but we need to add that to the carbon balance and, oh well, consider the losses of carbon from combustion, but we need to include all of those aspects to then compare the carbon balance of that burned, prescribed burned peatland to an alternative cut one. Now there you don't lose, that's what we find, huge emissions after the cutting, but you find losses which are quite large year after year after year, because like with your lawn clippings, mostly they will decompose. It just takes longer. So that's why the reviewers pointed out we need a 20 year long study for once to actually allow us compare apples and apples and not apples and pears because you get a completely different carbon balance when you just have five years burning looks like a huge enormous loss compared to any other option. But when you go for 20 years, whoa, it looks completely different. Those initial combustion losses are actually very low when you look at it over a 20 year cycle, whereas the decomposition of brush becomes very large when you add year after year together. So all of a sudden, it actually looks now like that in the right conditions where a peatland is wet enough, and you burn and you don't damage the vegetation underneath the moss layer, which is very important, then that additional charcoal, together with a very small loss year after year from the initial combustion, actually might lock away more carbon, it could be, than when you cut it and you let it to decompose. Uh, and then it might be even worse not to do anything, because I mentioned that drying out of the peat with the old heather, so you stimulate microbial decomposition of the peat, which is really what you know, don't want. It's like draining a peatland, letting transpiration make it drier and drier year after year. And then you get the last aspect, which now we have discussed over the last few years, because in relation to climate change, wildfire risk increases, especially Oh, well, when peatlands are vulnerable, so late spring and early summer or midsummer, when every peatland is likely to be dry and it's a tinderbox. And what you then get is not just losing the vegetation on the top during a time when 
oh, well, heather management would be done during winter when it's wet and cold underneath, so you just burn the vegetation. No, it can happen any time, most likely when the peat is also dry underneath, so you get not just the loss from the vegetation, you also burn into that peat layer, and that could smolder for weeks or months, and you lose decades, hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years of accumulated carbon. One, once peatlands catch fire, they're very difficult to extinguish. So that is a big issue, but we are not looking at that particular issue in our study, although we find clear evidence that drying increases that wildfire risk. So we need to watch that. Yeah, it's good you mentioned re-wetting. So our initial sort of DEFRA title, project title, actually included the word restoration in it. Because you can use management, any management tool, in, in light of trying to restore something in the long term. So to make it wetter is a particular issue. So re-wetting. So either burning of vegetation or cutting you could use to re-wet a bog. It seems really odd to think that with burning. But what you do is you get rid of that huge biomass, which transpires a lot of water. So actually what we find in our burning study is that although initially after burning, you make a peatland drier, and that seems to be because of enhanced runoff. Because you got rid of the vegetation and you allow water to run off quicker uh, after a fire, then compared to cutting where you leave the brush behind, you sort of end up with a pack of maybe five to 10 centimeters of brush where the water can infiltrate and it's slower to run off. It gets into the peat in a slower way. So you end up actually initially with a burnt peatland being drier than a mown one, which is wetter compared to the uncut, unmanaged heather. That's what we find. And that was the case over the first five years. But after five years, you turned it actually around. So the burn one became wetter. Now, this is a really interesting point, and other studies have found that, but they have not actually reported on that, that sort of after 10 years of burning, those peatlands tend to be wetter. Uh, and we don't quite understand yet why. Uh, I, I'd love to find out, but I think I need more time in order to understand the processes there. But that is very important again, because you, any management you do is a form of disturbance. And the long-term restoration aims, they require long-term monitoring, long-term views on shifting how a system works, what the end result is. So a five-year study will not tell you at all. So the reviewers were right. So we are seeing surprises now, but they seem to relate to previous studies, which is very reassuring. So it's not just us finding that. Uh, and then, of course, you have the long-term issue of the unmanaged one getting drier, getting drier, getting drier, possibly catching fire. And then you compare something completely different. Yeah, I, I think one issue in the UK is, maybe also in other parts in Europe, is that we look at the landscape and we think, oh, could we not just let that look after itself? But there are two issues with that. Firstly, it's climate change. Uh, things change. We can't compare a future to a past previously because it's been under a different climate. Uh, so the system will experience changes in wildfire risk uh, outside of our control. So we can't compare the past tells us, oh, it'll all be fine. It might not be fine. And the other issue is that it's an inherently managed landscape we are looking at, and people tend to forget that. So when we look at the upland moorlands now, heather dominated, uh, people say, oh, well, they would have been wooded previously. There is little evidence for that, uh, apart from the slopes. Uh, where the wind speeds wouldn't be too high and where trees can get a foothold in the bedrock underneath. Uh, and then it's a different game. But on deep peat, uh, there's little evidence that it was actually forested. But what does happen is when we don't manage it is <laughs> that trees will seed in those areas and they will start to grow. And we see that now, again, the past doesn't tell us the future because Sitka spruce is a non-native tree. 
but it's very happy and efficient to self-seed on those moorlands. And I look with big fear across the British moorland landscape now, seeing Sitka spruce come up everywhere. And it's a huge effort to rip those trees out once they establish themselves. They love that environment and they dry out peat very efficiently. So again, it's not a good idea, I think, to let those trees establish themselves. Although my, some people might think, oh, woodland is good, it's locking away carbon. But you need to look at the peat carbon where most of the carbon is. It's not in the vegetation. That is a tiny proportion of the carbon in those systems. So if we allow anything to affect the wetness of the peat underneath, that will have a much bigger impact than what we lock away above ground because you are likely to lose so much more from the stored carbon. So trees on a wet board is a bad idea, I think. So that is where we need to think large scale, no management might not be a good idea. Uh, and the third aspect is also that when you have a very uniform landscape, not only increase your fire risk in a wildfire, really getting big impact because it can consume fuel over a vast area and build up heat and damage. But you also lose the microhabitats when you manage, it could be burning, it could be cutting, it could be grazing, whatever management, to open up old vegetation, to allow different vegetation to take a foothold, to get different communities of vegetation, different ages of vegetation, you increase biodiversity. Uh, many times over, if you look at butterfly, moths, uh, insects, it, it has a huge impact if you compare a uniform landscape, like with a wheat field, oilseed rape field. Not a good idea. You want to have small fields, different crops, different biodiversity, different habitats. Firstly, definitely trees are part of the solution uh, in many ways. So biodiversity, so you, you want ideally a mixed forest. It, it will enhance biodiversity, take the red squirrel. It, it, it relies on it. But you want to have, secondly, the right tree in the right place. And I think that again opens up a lot of issues like our trees on wet bog is a bad idea, it, be it Sitka spruce or be it pine. It, it will dry out the peat. And you have to be very careful what you do to the peatland. Uh, however, there will be certain peatlands with shallow peat where it will be a good idea potentially to have trees growing and the carbon balance might actually be quite positive. Uh, but we need to understand that more. Uh, but recent studies from, I think it was Stirling uh, University, really show that peats and trees might not be a good combination. But again, we lack long-term research. Uh, it always boils down to that. Uh, so I'd say the right tree in the right place and be very careful letting trees establish themselves or planting trees on wet peat because you might actually result unwanted losses of carbon. And you would increase fire risk, of course, because a, a canopy fire uh, reaches completely different temperatures. So, and again, most likely they will appear when it's very difficult to control. Scale is a very important issue. Uh, the scale of management, and the scale you look at the impacts across a landscape scale. When you do, as a scientist, studies at a plot level, you can find huge impacts. Uh, oh well, it's like a little wound on, on your hand when you zoom in there with the lens. It looks massive and you see a massive blood loss. Uh, it might be a very small wound, but it will look impressive through a magnifying glass. But when you actually look at the entire body, there's not even a, a measurable loss of blood. Uh, it's within the arrow of measurement, I bet you. Uh, and that can be the same with very careful management. Across the landscape, you might not see any real negative impact uh, that might be related to water quality, to actual flood risk further down. But when you look at the plot scale, you will certainly find a big impact. So it's important we don't lose sight of 
looking at study cell evidence, what is actually relevant to the landscape scale, to the people living down there being faced with flooding, uh, if we take flooding as an example. Uh, because there, there are many ways, again, it, the plot might reveal a big runoff, but then further down you have an area of rushes or whatever which slows it down again uh, or which hasn't been managed for uh, many many years so uh, again the runoff will slow it will infiltrate so uh, what is the actual impact that is i think where we are still really struggling to understand the evidence base and turning it upside down that's still also the case with re-wetting with uh, our filling in drainage ditches, uh, which we should do, and replanting bogs with more sphagnum moss, which holds water for a long time much better. Again, we should do that. We should get sphagnum on peatlands where we have lost it. But we don't have the evidence base yet to say X amount of doing X, Y, Z actually has X percent impact on flooding. We don't have that. We'd love to. Uh, we just, I wish we would have done studies like this decades ago, and we should have, but we just didn't. And there are some other studies which have been published in 2016 and 18. There are some key papers from other scientists, not just me, saying, oh, watch out, what, what, what you're asking for here is you shouldn't, firstly, one paper says, you, you shouldn't dismiss a tool especially not when we don't know yet what the impacts are, even more so if we don't know what the impacts are of the alternatives, so cutting, for example, or not doing anything. Uh, and another one, actually, which looked through the entire evidence base and basically compared in a table, uh, what are the impacts on water quality, carbon and biodiversity of cutting versus burning or whatever? And it, you find a mix of responses. So we don't know. That's the take home message of that one paper. We don't know. And they clearly state, those two papers, it, currently we don't know what the impact of prescribed burning is in the UK. We just don't know. And we even less so know for the alternatives. So we, we need to have an open debate on this until we have the evidence. And I think that's where government agencies and landowners and land users need to work together. Firstly, acknowledge this and not follow this headline news of burning is always bad or burning peatlands. Now, now cut through all of this. Look at the actual evidence, what the actual scientists tell you the evidence is. Take that, discuss it, debate it come to a conclusion where you all agree on and then go forward from there. And if you want to try out tools, do it in, in, in a mutual sort of way. That's my advice. Do it side by side. So we actually get the scientific evidence as part of your land management plan. And I think landowners are very willing to assist with this. I think policy makers might be surprised uh, what support there might be because ultimately they want to manage their land in the best possible way. Uh, but I think that's where we got stuck. We have followed headline news and now it's become a, a black versus white, uh, white them versus us issue and that's never helpful. Maybe the most interesting aspect was coming as a German, coming over here from outside the UK, I didn't have a clue about grouse moor management. And to me, my project is not about grouse moor management anyway. It wasn't for DEFRA either. It was for managing heather-dominated peatlands. They happen to be under a lot of grouse moor management, but again, you can disentangle the two if you wanted to. So I'm very much looking at it from an outside grouse moor uh, sort of controversial aspect and just look at those systems are very important for biodiversity. Globally, they are very important. They're very important carbon stocks. They provide 70% of our drinking water in the UK. So uh, let's do it right. We use them for recreation as well. So everybody wants them to be intact. Uh, and those people who make a living from them certainly want that. But you always have 
black sheep. Uh, you always have some bad land management, but you have that with any management. Uh, so don't just throw everything out because of a few bad examples. Identify them and find a mechanism to improve it, to, to make it better. I think that's what we should do. It relates a lot to educate and also to educate the public and scientists. I mean, we, that's what science is about. It's, it's uncovering and, and educating yourself. I mean, you are asking a question and set up an experiment to obtain the observations to then either say, yes, my assumption stands up to evidence or not. And uh, you gain the understanding and that allows educating yourself and the public and policymakers uh, to then make the right decisions. And we need to move forward with evidence because things are changing. The wildfire risk is changing. Peatlands will get most likely drier in summer and wetter in winter. So any management needs to consider that uh, because you might get unwanted consequences of just going for one management or one restoration strategy. Uh, you need to adapt tools and take the right tool for the right place, like taking the right tree for the right place. It's not one tool fits all. I think that is clear. That's no farmer would, would do that because your patches of land, your soil texture is different. You adapt your management tools. And I think that's what we have to consider in the UK. Oh, well, it is a controversial issue, uh, prescribed burning. But firstly, is it actually a, a controversial issue very much UK-centred because it's mixed up with so many other issues, with preconceptions, with disliking certain management, certain activities, certain ownerships, I guess. That's where it becomes really muddy, the water. And I think, as a scientist, what I try to do is look through that to, to really focus on the actual issue of prescribed burning. Uh, so for me it's always been difficult when you read a headline like peatland burning. It's not peatland burning. If anything, it actually prevents the peatland to burn. It burns vegetation in a prescribed way to counteract a fire risk, which then is likely to burn into the peat. And then you have a burning peatland, which nobody wants. The land mentioned neither, the public certainly not, and the water company not. Uh, but so we, we need to separate those issues of headline news, uh, putting it all in a, in a bad basket like, wow, this is always bad. Uh, because when we look outside the UK, prescribed burning is a tool which is managed and seen as a vital tool to prevent wildfires. Uh, it has been and so for, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, and there is a wealth of knowledge of how to do it, when to do it, where not to do it, and how not to do it. And I think the UK is slowly opening up to that, to reaching out to uh, managers, to, to, to scientists in Spain, in Portugal, in, in, in areas where a hotter climate has been part of the equation for much longer, and where Heather Mullins have experienced fires for much longer and that's becoming now relevant in the UK. We can't ignore that. So we should certainly not rule out a tool which has been shown to be vitally important under scenarios which now become increasingly likely in the UK. So we should consider all the tools but we should also say certain tools not to be used under certain conditions and there are alternatives available. So comparing cutting to burning really shows trade-offs. Uh, oh well, if you cut with large machinery, you get rid of microtopography because the machinery just chops whatever is in its way. Uh, and that's not good news for certain birds to find dry nesting ground on a wet bog when everything is low to water level. So you want a microtopography which allows different habitat niches to survive. So burning doesn't do that. It, it maintains that microtopography and that's what we found. So you need to think about that. But burning 
does create some initial runoff issue. So there is a trade-off there, but maybe combining the two and you get the best of both worlds. So we need to have an open mind, I think, and an open debate uh, without those issues influencing your perception of things. We need to look at the actual evidence.